if you are able to enable people and, and those people can create something very special or, or go their own way, that gives a lot back. Welkom Alfred, Alfred Wittmer, CEO of AXA ARAC sinds 2016, uh, Switzerland's leading legal protection insurer. And thank you so much for taking the time for this Why Lead interview. Every CEO, every leader has a unique story. Um, I'd like to start with the beginning, so can you tell us when you, where you were born uh, and raised, and especially what, what shaped you? I think what shaped me is my background. So basically I was uh, born in Switzerland, raised up in Switzerland, but with two nationalities. So my father is Swiss and my mother is Spanish. So I lived always in, in those two cultural contexts, or <laughs> probably more in the merge of those two cultural contexts. And that's definitely one of the biggest dimensions which uh, shaped my future life then. Mm -hmm. And how, how would you say did it shape you? What? I think it shaped in terms of knowing that, that you have a, it sounds a bit strange, but that you have a core, so mm -hmm. you have a stability, you have an identity, mm -hmm. but there's still another identity outside there. And, and I felt always, all also during school or during primary school especially, that that you're in one identity, primarily in the Swiss identity. Yeah. But when I went to Spain on holidays, summer holidays, visiting my family, I felt much stronger in the other identity. So that the presence of that second identity mm -hmm. was stronger when I was there. So what does it mean basically in, in, in my career or also during my studies? Um, I always paid attention, well, is there a second or third dimension outside? Mm -hmm. it sounds a bit odd, but uh, it, it's not just that you have a single view of the things. There are always different dimensions, different angles. You can look at things yeah. or at persons. And you learned that at a very early age. Quite intuitively, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. And when you were a child, did you have a dream? Did you already know what you wanted to do when you grew up? So I want to become a farmer and why that? Probably because my grandparents both were yes. farmers and especially when I was on holidays in Spain during the summer break, three to five weeks, I always went with my grandfather to put out the cows on mm -hmm. the field. And so from the very young age onwards, it was the desire to become a farmer as well. Yeah. That changed eventually. Mm -hmm. So later on, I think at the age between eight to twelve, I thought, well, pilot would be very interesting. So I got a book with, with um, about Swiss Air and everything, what happens at the airport, what happens in the plane. Mm -hmm. And I was very impressed. So that was one of the second professional goals yep, I wanted yep. to achieve. But both didn't happen. So <laughs> I didn't became, become a farmer, I didn't become a pilot. Yeah. So the reality brought you on a journey towards uh, the world of insurances. So, what attracted you into this world, or what pulled you into the world of insurances? I, I would say if you talk to, to insurance executives, almost everybody's going to tell you it was somehow like an accident or a coincidence that, that, that they stumbled into insurance. Mm -hmm. And I would say it was the same on my side, because uh, what I was studying was contemporary history, political science and international relations. So I was really on the track to become a diplomat. Mm -hmm. And then when I was studying in London, I bumped into the world of economy, in the world of business. I was invited to workshops uh, for, from investment banks and strategy consulting mm -hmm. companies. So I discarded quite quickly everything which was around banking that wasn't that interesting to me or didn't sound that interesting to me. But everything around strategy, consulting, looking into different uh, industries, that was highly interesting. So I opted for that and I started my career, professional career, but in strategy consulting. Yeah. 
And that's where the first coincidence happened with mm -hmm. insurance. So I thought, oh, I'm going to do fancy projects in the automotive industry with Porsche, BMW. That didn't happen. My very first project was an insurance project. And uh, when my manager told me, listen, as of next week, you will work for a global insurance company. Mm -hmm. We have a six month assignment. I thought, oh my gosh, not insurance. What a boring world. <laughs> Um, yeah, I started the project and I have to say or admit within a couple of weeks I somehow fell in love with the insurance in industry because if you look, if, if you get to know the insurance industry yep. inside yep. or inside out, it's a highly interesting yep. industry because it's very complex and at mm -hmm. the same time you can do a lot, you can transform a lot and it's still the case today, so yep. 50, yep. more or less 15 years later. Wow. That's fascinating. So what was the trigger uh, for, for awakening the passion for insurances? I think it's, it's somewhere, big, it, it, it's, it's very technical insurance. Mm -hmm. So we have the underwriting, which is mm -hmm. based on statistics and pricing risks, um, analyzing risks. So it's very, very analytical work. And on the other side, it's also very human. Mm -hmm or societal because mm -hmm. you're basically enabling a growing economy because without insurance and that's the high purpose of insurance I think the economies which we see today would, would not exist and especially in the case of Switzerland without Swiss Re, without uh, Zurich insurance company without uh, Schweizerische Rentenanstalt, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the Swiss economy would not be that strong as it is today. So insurance played a major role mm -hmm. in the last 150 years of the economic and historic development of Switzerland and yeah. definitely also on a, on a global scale. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So both in balance between technicality of the business but the human and societal touch of the business that makes it really interesting. Yeah, and then on a bigger scale, the economy that is uh, impacted and Absolutely. created, shaped. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then your journey continued, and you came to AXA Arak. So what what brought you here? That was really interesting because I spent many years abroad working for another global insurance mm -hmm. company. So I spent uh, my professional career in insurance, first in Switzerland, then I went to Spain, to Barcelona, and, and I spent almost three years in Casablanca in Morocco. Um, started off as a chief operations officer for the local business, uh, where I had the, the, the task to, to transform together with the CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I got to different roles in addition to that role, so Chief Information Officer, Chief Claims Officer. And already if you listen to that, that's, that's, a, that's quite, quite a big bunch of role or a big bird. Mm -hmm. And that definitely kind of, of, of impacted my, my career where I am today. So to cut it short, then after Morocco I went on to London, and then I told myself after having worked four to five years abroad, I want to go back to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And I remember quite well when I was sitting in a Starbucks in London and telling myself, I'd like to go to, back to Switzerland. Exactly in that moment, I received a call from AXA wow. uh, asking me if I would be interested for that role. And then I said, yes, definitely. That sounds really interesting. That's how the, the yeah. first talk started on that role. Thank you for sharing that. It's always amazing how synchronicity happens in moments like that. We start with a coffee, we think it, and it happens. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So when you became the CEO of AXA Arak, would you say that you were prepared for the job? Not at all. <laughs> so I was really jumping into the cold water. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew a bit from the interviews with, uh, with the people from AXA Switzerland, with the board of director interviews, what the situation is more or less, but you only, in, in those circumstances, you only get about 20 to 30 percent of the real <laughs> picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other 70 percent you figure out in the, in the subsequent months you start or you are on the job. 
So there, there were a lot of surprises, uh, both negative and yeah. positive surprises. Uh -huh. And I wasn't prepared at all. What I did myself is kind of mentally preparing on the job, what is expecting you, you're stepping in, SEO, mm -hmm. uh, people have expectations, uh, what is he going to do, what is he going to change, where will he put his focus. Of course, I, I had those questions as well in my mind, because you always know that if, if you're mm -hmm. at the top, people are watching you. And yes. every step you do um, leaves an impact on the organization, both as well on the positive side as yeah. well and on Absolutely. the negative side. Well, the first first couple of weeks and months were really an adventure on the job, and it was yeah, it was firefighting in the beginning, but it became quite quickly uh, straightforward. Well, not not hundred percent straightforward mm -hmm. journey. But it became a journey where, with a clear direction where I want to go myself and, and where I saw the company in the future. Of course, it's not only my vision, but it's also the vision of the board of directors and, and with, the, with the executive team, but we shaped it together and, and that became quite quickly a clear direction. Mm -hmm. And on this journey, is there something that you would say this is what triggered my biggest growth curve or that was my greatest learning? Or, um... I had a very intense time in Morocco, mm -hmm. so it was, it was lots of pressure, lots to do, um, a huge transformation to lead and above all in a completely different cultural context. So it was very challenging, but also rewarding. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun, but sometimes, um, yeah, it was very difficult <laughs> on a personal level as well. But it definitely shaped my learning curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still thinking a lot back to those times, what what I went through, what I thought at this, uh, at this certain point in time, and how I do it today. Mm -hmm. So what I can say in that during that time mm -hmm. in Morocco, I was more into firefight or always into firefighting mode. Whereas today I'm much more balanced on the job. Yeah. Even if there's a storm coming up, I'm, I'm, I try to remain calm. Yeah. And uh, I think in 90% of the cases, I can remain calm. So it sounds like you were prepared for the job. Somehow, yes. I think looking back, I have to say the experience in Morocco prepared me yeah. to do that job. Yeah, on a, on a proper level, I would say. Yeah, yeah definitely. Well, yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Do, do you have a leadership philosophy or a motto or a set of values that you live by that are important for you in your leadership that you stand for? I have not a very philosophical statement or vision to very, very plain, but I think very powerful uh, principles. The very first is walk the talk. Mm -hmm. Do what you talk about or yeah. what, you, what you preach uh, or what you tell to the people. You need to lead by example, because if you don't do it, then people don't believe mm -hmm. in you. And the second one is straight talk. So basically not not swimming around the, 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 the hard issues or the nagging issues, but getting straight to those issues, naming, phrasing those issues, and of course trying to resolve those issues together with the yeah. team. Yeah. So these are my two light motifs. Nice. Walk the talk and talk straight. That goes with a lot of integrity, openness, transparency. Yeah. 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 Um, there are about 200 people working here at AXA ARAC in Switzerland. And in your CEO position, your leadership impact leaves footprints. So if people would talk about the free gifts you gave them, what would they be? What, is, what are you leaving? What are the footprints you're leaving here on people? It's very very challenging questions not to, to determine already now kind of a legacy but mm -hmm. uh, I think one, one of the very first gift I would say is that and again it's, I think it's not only me because it's basically then 
a strong teamwork together with my executive team, how we shaped the company the last two years. But when I started here, it was a very hierarchical culture. And in some departments, you, you had people they didn't really trust. They were as well kind of anxious. What can I do? What I'm allowed to do? What I'm not allowed to do? Um, do I get punished if I'm doing something wrong? So it was kind of uh, big in, in German Angstkultur. And I think what we managed successfully in the last two years is to get rid of that culture, that, this negative culture. Mm -hmm. It's a much more open culture right now. It's a collaborative culture. We talk about things that do not work and basically nobody's getting punished because mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> and, and I think the biggest gift behind that is giving freedom to, to, to the employees. It, 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 sound, it sounds quite awkward, but basically if, if you're on the top, it's, it's you, you are the expert, you know how to do it, it's not the CEO, he does not know how to, to, to handle a claim mm -hmm. in our case properly, it's the expert, it's the mm -hmm. claims handler, the, the, the attorney, in our, because we are doing legal business here, mm -hmm. so he knows exactly what he needs to do, so it's him who, who needs to decide where do we want to go to, so I think that's the very first gift. The second gift is um, yet yeah, it's it's linked to that. It's it's linked to to abandon hierarchical culture. So to have to have motivation, daily motivation, to go to work mm -hmm. and to have pleasure to go to work. And uh, I think that is a big gift because I feel it in myself too. Because if 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 I'm quite imprisoned and I can only move in one square meter you're not that happy and motivated to go to work. So I think that's the second gift. Mm -hmm. And the third gift, what would it be? Yeah, spontaneously, it was just nothing jumping into my mind, but those two gifts yes. are really important. And they are huge. If, um, if I would bottom line them, you have given back the power to the people and the organization, the experts, and you brought back joy and pleasure. That's huge. That's huge, that's yeah. true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, that brings us to passion and purpose. Um, when we connect the dots between success and happiness, we can't get around our deeper why, our purpose, deeper meaning. So, I'd like to ask you the question, why do you lead? It's a very philosophical question. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember I had once, um, a couple of years ago, a coaching session, so where we went into that topic and mm -hmm. where the coach challenged me, why? are you on that track or on that journey and um, we were digging and digging and of course in the beginning I didn't know where she wanted to go but then in the end I knew why she wanted mm -hmm. to, to, to go along that way so that I get a feeling or, or a vision why I'm basically in that job I am today and of course when you start your professional career there are some guys who say yeah I will I would like to go to the top. I want to. I want to become the CEO of company X or Y. So that was not at all my purpose. So, mm. but what I felt already strong is when I was studying. I was working as a journalist, and I was working as an intern. So I'm doing uh, lots of research work, and I was a video journalist. So. Um, doing interviews and, 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 and putting the thing together, the clips mm -hmm. together, uh, and that was very interesting. And then later on, a couple of months later on, the, the editor-in-chief asked me, you want to take over responsibility to lead the news team? Mm -hmm. I was, well, at that young age, you, you want already to give me that responsibility? And then he said, well, I think you're powerful in leading people. 
I said to him, well, I don't know, but uh, yeah, let's give it a try. <laughs> And once I started off to, of course, in the, in the beginning, it was the asphalt firefighting because I had no leadership experience at all. But I would say that early experience at the age of about 20, 22, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about leadership and it was kind of intuitive leadership. Mm -hmm. Of course, also learning from mistakes because you do a lot of mistakes in the beginning. But then if you try to reflect, you can, you can yes. drive out a mm -hmm. lot of those mistakes. You can learn a lot. And I think that remained inside me because I, when I was in the consulting in industry, it was basically delivering your job. And of course, you had leadership elements as well in there, but it was more in the delivery mode. You needed to deliver. I learned a lot during the consulting time, but the leadership part, the dimension was missing. That was definitely missing. And I think that was the biggest trigger why I said, okay, I want to step out of the consulting industry would like to go into a line management position and take our responsibility and, and implement things, lead people and create something meaningful mm -hmm. and, and, and also being responsible if you, if you implement something with your team. Yeah. So not only the good times, but also the bad, bad mm -hmm. times. And I would say that that remains until now. It's, it's a very, if you're in a leadership position, you can create a lot and that I think that drives me. So yeah. creating, transforming, that that drives me every day, yeah. and, and gives a lot of joy and pleasure on the job. You radiate it as well when you talk about it. There's a lot of joy, and uh, yeah, I can sense the deep fulfillment there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I have a sense that why you really lead goes back to what we talked about before giving back the power to people and bringing back joy. There, there, I sense there is something there that sparks. I think the Sorry. most powerful is uh -huh. when you start to realize that you enabled a person to do something she wouldn't have um, tried to and then suddenly the person does it and does it very successful or impactful. And that gives a lot back, and, and, and that, that, that's always really nice to see. And, and that's where you know, okay, it's not, it's not like the old leadership style, that the command and control, mm -hmm. and the military style, because that doesn't work in today's world. But if you are able to enable people, and, and those people can create something very special, or, or go their own way, that gives a lot back to you. Mm -hmm. That's basically my... Yeah, but the why exactly that's yeah. my why, absolutely. Yeah. Wow, wow, well, the journey goes on. Um, what excites you most about what is next? So, the, the most exciting thing is for me personally uncertainty. So, today, I've because a couple of years ago, I would have had a plan. Okay, uh, after three years, you need to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, after five years, you, you would like to, to go on to the next career level. So today, I have not that feeling that I need to know where I am in two to three years. Of course, you have kind of a vision where you want to mm -hmm. go or where to land. But basically, I'm, I'm much more balanced today to live with that uncertainty. A couple of years ago, this would have driven me nuts or, or very insecure. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward into the future and I know that the right thing will come along at the right point in time. And so I have no pressure at all to think or, or hustle around what, what, what's the next thing I, I would like to do or yeah. do I need to prepare something that I'm getting to, to that position or, or to that level. So. Um, uncertainty excites me really. So you really are much. open to co-create the future with uh, whatever comes your way in this field of uncertainty. Definitely, never definitely. Yeah. I think that's also coming back to the point you mentioned before, so the experience I had during my work in Morocco, mm -hmm. was a big period of uncertainty. Uh, that shaped my, my, my life or, or my behavior today. Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm really relaxed what's coming along and I'm looking forward, excited to it, to it what's coming along next. And, and I love the joy you radiate that <laughs> comes with it. <laughs> That's a beautiful quality to experience with uncertainty. It's, you know. So, yes, my last question before ending this interview is, I'm just curious, is there anything that we touched on during this interview that gave you a deeper insight that you will take with you into your leadership more consciously? I think uh, this interview showed me again that take out some time of your daily business, of your routine business, um, and reflect and think about what you're actually doing. I think that was a very good opportunity mm -hmm. to step a little bit yeah. back and think about what you did, or what I did the last couple of months or years, mm -hmm. and, and what what basically shapes your your current life. So I think it's it's, it's a bigger takeaway. It's it's more on a, on a meta level, yeah. and um, because of course you in all leadership courses or or in in every coaching lesson. You would get the advice, take your time, step back a little bit, reflect about it. But once you're running, you're running. You, mm -hmm. you don't really take out that time. And um, that's, I think that's always good if, if yeah. you just step back a little bit, relax, and think about it, mm -hmm. and then move on. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, Alfred. Thank you very Thank much, you. Nicole. Mm -hmm.